what we need to understand as economists is to be um, a bit humble uh, to understand that we the that life goes beyond um, just dollars and cents that there are many things to consider what do we measure um, uh, when we say gdp um, do we measure peace do we measure stability uh, do we measure people can be poor and, and very happy people can be poor and very happy they, they, they basically um, beyond a certain level, um, money loses value for some people. Not everybody wants to be a billionaire. All they want is to be able to eat, have good nutrition, have an education for their children, and they probably are going to spend more time on religion, on uh, thinking, on philosophy, on the arts, uh, than on um, basically hours and hours trying to earn more money that they're going to put in a bank. The kind of... um, economies that we've built, where the bulk of the GDP is in financial assets, uh, where uh, people just sit in London and New York um, and basically transport money across the world into stock markets, into um, bond markets, um, make huge returns and take it back. I I don't think that is a sustainable model long term, it will make a few people very rich, but I don't think it's sustainable because it continues to um, extract wealth at the expense of the vast majority of the the world's population. Well, you know, from the very first lesson we learn in economics, um, and if economics lives up to its expectations of what it says it is, um, it is primarily about the um, prioritization of allocation of scarce resources in order to meet limited wants. And um, that fundamental reality um, exists no matter what ideological position you have, which is that the resources that we have available to us um, are nowhere near sufficient to meet all the needs that we have. And and to the extent that economics remains faithful to that, which is um, a recognition that this is about making the best use of our endowments um, in order to um, give humanity the highest quality um, of welfare, um, economics will continue to be relevant. Now, Obviously, um, uh, that is a question where um, there are a number of uh, booby traps. Um, How do you prioritize your needs? How do you make the choice? Uh, Who benefits from what choices you make? Who loses from what choices you make? Uh, 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 Which choices are absolutely necessary? Which ones are driven by the interests of those who are in political authority? Um, And therefore, all, all the debates in economics um, it, to my mind, um, basically flow uh, not from the fundamental question of the importance of the subject, but from uh, the, uh, the politics of it, the, 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 the human um, interventions, the, the choices that we make, the priorities that um, are explicit or implicit in the decisions that we take and the winners and losers um, um, as a result of those decisions. Um, but the fundamental question that we need to figure out how to allocate, how to utilize, how to maximize, how to distribute resources in order to make the life of humanity better, that um, um, will continue to be important um, uh, as, 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 a, as a question. So um, very often when you actually sit in a policy making position, uh, you're confronted with that, with that decision, especially if you sit with um, policy makers who have responsibility for society far beyond economics. So um, I'll give you an example from my experience when I was governor of the Central Bank. I was a member of uh, what's called the National Economic Council in Nigeria. That National Economic Council is chaired by the vice president it has in it the central bank governor, the finance minister, the budget and planning minister, um, and then all the governors of the states. So to give you just one instance, for example, we had 
a very strong um, position um, between myself and the finance minister on our side as, as, as technocrats in the government on the need to remove fuel subsidies. Okay, they were generated, they, they, were, they had a big hole um, um, in, 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 the, in the government's budget. Uh, we were basically um, effectively subsidizing consumption, keeping refineries in Europe open, depleting our foreign exchange reserves. Uh, we were um, weakening the government's fiscal position because the, the, the money could have been used um, better in other areas and so on. Now, we constantly and consistently as economists did not see the benefits of these subsidies in the long term, did not, um, we saw the dangers for the fiscal position and, 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 and the corruption of the system. On the other hand, for those who were taking the decisions, um, they were concerned about the perception that the poor were going to suffer with the removal of the subsidies. And we always had these debates where we were pushing for them and they were, and they were pushing back. I remember a meeting where they said to us, look, um, uh, Ngozi, you are not contesting elections. <laughs> okay, so you, you, you want to push us through this and, and then we'll get voted out, voted out of power. And, and in those meetings, we would say to them, look, um, our duty as economists is to tell you the implications of the decisions that you're taking. Okay, that for every $1 billion you take, um, you use to pay petroleum subsidies, it's $1 billion you've taken out of education, out of healthcare, out of infrastructure, out of security, out of power. Uh, it's $1 billion you're borrowing and adding to the government debt, which the next generation will have to pay. Now, it is up to you as politicians to decide that it is better for Nigerians to have cheap fuel than to have good education. It's better for them to have cheap fuel than to have power. That is a political decision. But from an economic perspective, I can tell you the decisions that you've taken by continuing to pay these fuel subsidies are suboptimal in terms of the uh, human capital benefits, in terms of the long-term um, uh, fiscal sustainability, in terms of encouraging the investments in domestic refining, uh, because uh, subsidized fuel basically discourages investment. So you, I can give you all sorts of um, consequences for that, but ultimately you will have to decide. And, and you know, you can feel uh, sometimes talking to them that they do understand these and they do accept, but they simply do not believe they can communicate this well enough uh, to people, uh, for people to understand that it is in their interest to pay a higher price for fuel because the money is going out to another, or there's of course a trust deficit and so on. So there was always that challenge between what economic theory says you should do and what you'd actually do, because when you actually come in there, you're having other uh, considerations. Um, and then of course, um, there, are, there are questions of other values that you've got to look at. Sometimes economics is not the only thing that matters. Um, you, you could take a decision that would, for example, um, attract um, foreign investment and lead to, um, to high GDP growth. Uh, but it could also mean that a significant part of the income is taken out of the country. And therefore, you have GDP growing, but the income of the local population not growing. And you could, take the, you could take the view that, yes, you might have slower GDP growth, but if you're creating jobs and employment for the lower income strata, it is probably better to, to have a local direct investment than a foreign direct investment. So um, for me, I think um, what we need to understand as economists is to be um, a bit humble, uh, to understand that, we, the, that life goes beyond um, just dollars and cents, that there are many things to consider, uh, and also um, that what we, uh, should, we should be on the table, we must be on the table, economic science should be an input into policy, but it should not be the sole and um, uh, sole determinant um, of policy. I think it does. I, I, I mean, as I, if you go back to what it is, um, I, I think it's totally inescapable. Uh, and, and, I, and I think, um, one of the uh, worst um, things a government can do to itself or, or, or politicians to themselves is ignore the discipline of economics. Um, 
I have seen, I mean, if you take, take the developing economies, take, take Nigeria, for example, and the issues that we have today. Uh, people talk about um, uh, insecurity, uh, we talk about increased poverty and so on, but at the end of the day, uh, you can actually trace some of the uh, roots of what we see as social problems, ethnic problems, religious problems, to wrong decisions um, as far as the economy is concerned. Um, at the end of the day, human beings need to survive. Human beings need to have a decent um, quality of life in order to, uh, to be uh, a decent, decent human beings. And uh, without um, allocating the resources of the nation in such a way as to guarantee a decent welfare for the vast majority of the people, you're not going to have um, all the other things that you need uh, for society to thrive. You're not going to have peace, you're not going to have security, uh, you're not going to have um, a functioning democracy because uh, with poor people with a little amount of money, you can compromise the system, you can have fraudulent elections. So every single thing we said for ourselves does not work uh, because people um, uh, have people are struggling to have that basic fundamental um, um, life which they need without which they can do nothing they can't worship so you, you have religious problems because of people uh, looking for food and um you, you you find fights between religions but they're really because they really fights over resources uh, you have fights among um, today in nigeria between the uh, fulani ethnic group who are herdsmen and farmers but it's an age-old struggle for resources you be struggling for water you're struggling for, uh, for land. And until we understand that at the heart of this problem, it's not an ethnic issue between um, a herdsman, an ethnic, her, ethnic herdsman and ethnic farmers, but the fact that you've got a large population, you've got diminishing water resources, you've turned um, grazing fields into farmlands, you've turned farmlands into houses, and you've got to actually see it as a resource allocation problem. How much land do you need for housing? And maybe you should start, start building houses vertically instead of horizontally. So you have enough land left for farming, enough land for grazing. Until we uh, begin to understand uh, that at the heart of many of the social problems are economic uh, questions. Uh, I think we're not going to have a solution to the social problems. I, I don't think it does, um, or, or our structure today, it, um, it, um, the, the Disney itself does not cover, cover those things. Um, but I also am not sure it's so much a fault of economics as a failure of people to realize the limitations of every discipline. Uh, economics cannot answer all the questions. Um, and, and we therefore need to understand that economics is an economic theory is just one input, as I said, into a wider policy. Um, however, uh, there are hidden um, um, prejudices sometimes in the, in, the, in the manner in which we ask economic questions and in, in which we approach issues. So for example, there's um, a fundamental sense that, oh, markets are good. There's, there's the fundamental sense that the price is um, a fair value. There's a fundamental assumption that um, if you allow the um, free markets to work and allocate resources, then the outcome um, is okay. Now, um, so to that extent, there are certain assumptions in economics that have been extremely damaging. Uh, in the, the richest, uh, the, the, I think the, maybe the two richest Africans today are, are from Nigeria. Uh, certainly the richest Adiko Dangote is from Nigeria. Uh, he's also from a state called Kano. And yet in that state, 77% of the population is living in extreme poverty. And Nigeria today has the highest number of poor people in the world. So how come you, you're producing the, the wealthiest African, but you're also the poverty capital of the continent and the poverty capital, poverty capital of the globe. There must be something fundamentally wrong uh, with, with, with the way economics are structured to create those kinds of extreme inequalities. And, um, and so to that extent, um, if those um, outcomes are a result 
um, of economic policy, then, um, then economics is somehow responsible for these um, social outcomes. And, and, and then the, you lead to all those issues about, um, uh, and of course, you've got malnutrition, you've got a lack of um, investment in education, um, so you've got um, huge infant mortality, you've got maternal mortality, you've got climate change. And is that really, um, it's, it may not be the fault of economics, but it would help if in designing economic policies, uh, we widened the horizon, we broadened our thinking to ask what are the implications of this on different social groups? What are the implications on different value systems and what are we encouraging? Um, I also think, the, the overarching um, focus on economics and financial status and, um, and, and uh, on what, is, what we can count has undermined um, other values. Um, for example, uh, why, is, why, why is it more important to uh, support an, an, an investment in a company than to support an investment in the education or the nutrition of the child. Now, it could be a drain on the economy, financial, in terms of financial outcomes, um, it could be a drain, but, but what value do you put on the human life? What value do you put on the happiness of the child? What value do you put on, on, on the welfare of the child? So do, what do we measure um, uh, when we say GDP? Um, do we measure peace? Do we measure stability? Uh, do we measure people can be poor and, and very happy? People can be poor and very happy. They, they, they basically, um, beyond a certain level, um, money loses value for some people. Not everybody wants to be a billionaire. All they want is to be able to eat, have good nutrition, have an education for their children, and they probably are going to spend more time on religion, on uh, thinking, on philosophy, on the arts, uh, than on. Um, basically hours and hours trying to earn more money that they're going to put in a bank. So in what way have we, by emphasizing all the time, reminding people that they're poor, they're poor and they need to, to get more, in what way have we changed the values of people, um, changed their sense of self-worth? How have we made it possible for someone who is a very decent person, who has high integrity, who is... Um, uh, who, who, who's, who has a high moral, moral sense, feels so worthless because he does not have um, a certain economic status because that is the hierarchy that's encouraged by economic thinking. Uh, you feel inadequate because you don't own um, um, e um, e economic assets. So um, I, I think we can, um, having had a basic knowledge of economics, um, also try to broaden, go back to being like the classical economists who are basically moral philosophers like Adam Smith, go beyond uh, um, economic questions. And I think that's what we've lost. I mean, many people talk about Adam Smith's wealth of nations. A few people talk about his theory of moral sentiments. So, you know, the, the whole idea that um, a human being is not just an economic being, uh, but he's the totality and that economists need to understand that. I think that's what we need to get back to. Well, first of all, I, I think people who get into positions of policy as presidents and governors um, should uh, try to get some understanding of how economists work. Part of the problem, obviously, is if you don't have a basic knowledge of economics, um, you've got no choice but just to rely on the advice that's given by, by professionals and technocrats. But also, um, I, I think that the that economists differ. I think part of the problem is um, politicians also pick the economists that uh, suit their ideological leanings. Okay, so um, when Margaret Thatcher became Prime Minister of England um, at that time, the, the Bank of England had a number of economists that had bought into monetarism. And, and, she, and it, it's, it basically suited an ideological position that she had, and she took that up and applied it in the United Kingdom. I don't know, Dragon uh, uh, basically brought Milton Friedman out of the margins and made him center um, 
of, of economics, and then that spread to the World Bank, to the IMF, to uh, um, the um, international uh, multilateral organizations, and, and then monetarism became the gospel that spread around the world. Now, uh, how much of that is really um, economics and how much of it was politics, how much of it was politicians selecting a certain interpretation of economics that was consistent with their ideological predisposition. So uh, you, you, would blame, you could blame Milton Friedman, but Milton Friedman was not the one who implemented the policies and he'd been there for how many decades and nobody uh, took that and implemented it. So this decision was taken by Ronald Reagan, to taken by Margaret Thatcher. And um, so I, I think ultimately um, we have uh, those in policy making positions have a responsibility to listen to the different shades of opinion, to understand that economics is not um, a one uh, uh, one brush fits all. That it's it's it's, it's a combination. There's a whole continuum of thinking uh, in economics, and to understand that each position has certain implications and certain social outcomes. So if you, uh, today, uh, if you listen to, um, j just before the election, to Donald Trump, for example, Donald Trump was celebrating his success and, and in the economy. And what was his, the measure of his success? The stock market, okay? So it, you have a situation in which the top 1% is getting so much richer in the middle of a pandemic, while the bottom, 30%, 40% is basically losing its livelihood. But you celebrate it because Wall Street, the stock market says you're doing well, okay? And, 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 and so um, who do you, is that the fault of economists or the fault of a president who thinks that his responsibility is to serve the interests of the top 1%? So um, there, 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 there are complex questions, um, uh, certainly um, economists who, um, promote um, and present as science um, a theoretical positions that are basically just designed to advance the interests of a particular segment of society need to be called out. Okay, we need to, we need to understand that. And, we, and I think it's about um, basically trying to look at the human beings behind, um, behind those numbers. And now as governor of central bank, I used to say to people, we need to look at the human beings. Uh, it's, you know, you know, when you, and, and, and most many people don't understand that. If GDP falls by 1%, that you can, if you just divide that by the minimum wage, you can actually calculate the number of human beings that have been thrown out of work and the amount of income that has been taken out of the pockets of people. Now, where did that 1% hit most? Did it hit the top 1%? or did it hit the bottom 1%? And there is a difference. If it hit the top 1%, it's no problem because it doesn't hurt them. For the bottom um, 20, 30%, a 1% drop in GDP, maybe the difference between life and death, between survival and, and non-survival. And, and I think um, it's, do we as economists do that? If you have inflation, or as central bank governors say, you have an inflation rate of 8%, 9%, will go down to the consumer price index. Look at what products have actually been affected by inflation. And you may very well find that the bulk of the, of the, of the items consumed by the very poor food may have gone up by 50% or 60%. And, and that is concealed. You don't see that under an 8%, 9% inflation number. Where, where, when in fact, that 9% is so unevenly distributed that the very poor who need to be protected are the ones who are suffering from rising food prices. And, and so um, I, I think it's extremely important that um, economists become, uh, are compelled to be uh, uh, more, um, uh, more realistic. This, I, this obsession with equations and graphs needs to, needs to, needs to be um, toned down. And we need to go back to looking at the implications on real human beings of um, economic um, uh, um, indices. Difficult question. <laughs> Capitalism means many things to, um, uh, to many people. Um, 
I, I suppose that um, going back to the to the theory of value, um, and if you or if you go back to uh, to the old discussions of capital, going back to, to Karl Marx, uh, uh, you you could think of uh, capitalism primarily as the study of an economy in which the um, owners of surplus capital uh, try to invest it in a manner, uh, are the key drivers of economic growth or, or, or the production of goods and services. And um, a lot of capitalist production um, and capitalist system revolves around protecting capital. Um, how do you facilitate the investment, the, the conversion of surplus value into capital? How do you um, facilitate the extraction of that surplus value? How do you encourage the reinvestment of that surplus value? Uh, the, the problem is not so much that um, capitalism has become, the problem is not so much capitalism, but the fact that capitalism has not become uh, capital in the interest of capitalists as opposed to capital in the interest of the real economy. So, um, if you take the United States today, if you take um, all the work that's been done by Piketty and uh, a, a number of um, economists around global inequality, uh, that is what has happened. Um, it's now um, a question of the owners of capital uh, putting capital to work, uh, but taking as much of the returns of capital as possible to themselves and denying the rest of the economy, basically undervaluing labor and undervaluing the wider society, uh, which is why you have all these um, low tax regimes, you have all these tax havens, you have um, uh, a lack of corporate social responsibility, and you then have this situation where nations are getting richer and richer, but um, the levels of inequality are totally um, um, not explainable by any kind of um, merit, any kind of intelligence, any kind of um, quality, other than the fact that some people had the um, privilege of being owners of, of capital at the beginning. Um, I think the uh, Europe after, after Weber, uh, I, I think the, the whole idea of the Protestant ethic, I think the idea of the British welfare state uh, that happened after the Industrial Revolution as a result of these huge inequalities and poverties. Um, I think we lost that in the 1980s and we haven't regained that. Um, but the truth is the inequalities that we see today um, globally and within countries, um, vertically and horizontally, uh, actually um, mirror the kind of inequalities we had in the immediate post-Industrial Revolution era and, uh, and the post-World uh, War I era. And, and we, it is not, it's no surprise that we're now having um, a kickback um, against economics. Um, uh, people are beginning to question uh, where economics has led us to and the kind of concerns that people had um, in the 1920s and 30s are the same concerns that people are having today. Um, is, is this system optimal? Is it fair? Uh, and Mike Carney recently gave the Reef Lectures BBC, and he raised this question of um, value and values. Um, should we, uh, how, I mean, we've privileged GDP growth, uh, per capita income, rates of inflation. Those are, you know, yes, but how about our values? How about fairness? How about justice? How about equity? How about compassion? How about empathy? What kind of what kind of values do we have as a people that that should then underpin and undergird the capitalism that we have? So you you, you have in a, you, in a sense you can have different types of capitalism, while the fundamental uh, uh, underlying premise is the appropriation. Um, going back to Marx of of, of surplus value uh, and its investment and uh, of obviously, you have the, uh, what you call the composition of capital. You basically in, uh, increase capital intensity and increase the return on capital. But how do you then, 
what is the objective of that investment? Is it to maximize the return to the capitalist or to society? How do you measure that? How do you, so that, that defines your tax regime. Look at um, Norway, for example, it's a capitalist country, but obviously um, uh, in Norway is a different type of capitalism from the United States of America. And, uh, and which, which, which capitalism should we aim for? I would say Norway gives, gives, a, gives a much better model than the United States or the, or the United Kingdom. I would say continental Europe gives a better model than the United Kingdom. Um, but that, again, is a personal view. And I think what is important is to um, have an open conversation on the, ide on the ideology. Capitalism can be pushed forward as a value. We're promoting capitalism. But are you promoting capitalism because it raises the vast majority of people out of poverty? Why are you promoting capitalism because it provides an opportunity for a small number of people to make extreme um, amounts of money at the expense of the rest of society? Okay, I know we're discussing economics, but not religion. Let me... Uh, say, uh, maybe I, I should say, I, 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 you know, in, in Islam, the prophet had, had a statement. He said, um, a system can endure with unbelief, but it cannot endure with injustice. At the end of the day, um, no system that is um, based on a fundamental injustice can endure forever. If you look at the histories of most of those systems, um, what happened was that they were built based on certain values um, of equity and justice and fairness, and then got commandeered and hijacked by powerful groups, lost sense of those values, and that led to their collapse. I still feel that if we go back to what are the enduring values on which human society is built. Compassion, empathy, justice, um, especially taking care of the bottom of the pyramid. And that's why some of the issues that have been raised in global discourse today are important. How do we treat our women? What, how about the rights of children? Uh, are we thinking about the environment? Uh, what, 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 uh, what are the limits of global inequality? How about um, ethnic, racial um, disputes? How about um, our treatment of minorities? You know, those are, those are underlying, those are the underlying values that make a system um, durable and that continue to preserve it. And if we, I mean, capitalism reacted very quickly in the post-industrial era when socialism was taking over the rest of the world, people, um, the, the governments then realized uh, that if a social, if a welfare state was not set up, the socialism would simply take over um, the, uh, European society. Um, otherwise, um, you, you degenerate into fascism. So I, I think this sense of hubris, this sense of triumphalism, uh, this lack of um, remembering history is what is going to be the cause of the demise of capitalism. I mean, look at China. China, China calls itself a communist country, but China has a form of capitalism. <laughs> you know, it is a form of capitalism. Uh, you, you've, you've got all these millionaires um, in China, you've got all these companies that are, that are making money. You've got China coming to Africa um, on ideologically as an anti-imperialist um, uh, nation, but really just being part, just an alternate imperialism to the, to the United States and, and to Europe, basically doing to Africa what uh, imperialism did to Africa, which was taking away raw materials, taking away um, solid minerals, going in for land grabs, and then selling us finished goods and wiping out our industry, which is exactly what colonialism was about. Take raw materials and sell finished goods. And we've led, and this led to massive deindustrialization in Africa, uh, value extraction, 
from Africa, but in a manner that is not seen by Africans because historically, China has not been known to be an imperialist country that's come um, either in this, uh, not, not sure with slave trade or with colonialism, but the fundamental economics is there, which is that Africans are turned into suppliers of primary products to China, importers of finished goods, and therefore over time, the terms of trade will continue to tilt against the primary product producer. Africa will continue to get poorer at the, um, China will get richer at the expense of Africa and other trading partners. So I think um, understanding that, that China is a capitalist country, no matter what it says, is fundamental. If you think capitalism is just America and, and Europe, you make the mistake of raising up the bar and protecting yourself against predatory capitalism from the West while opening yourself up to more insidious predatory capitalism from the East. And, and so, uh, it, so for me, it's, um, if, if you think of capitalism fundamentally as the investment extraction of surplus value and its investment for the purpose of growth, then you've got so many capitalist countries in the world, East and West, and you, 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 it's about now what type of capitalism do you now forget the different political systems? Some are democracies, some are autocratic regimes, some are run by some are one party states and so on. Uh, but some have um, short term governments, some have long term uh, leaders. At the end of the day, the, the defining character is that they're all capitalists, but it's a large continuum. So you have to decide which capitalism you want. Well, I don't know. I think I think that um, in terms of what we've seen on ground um, with all uh, uh, previous systems, some forms of capitalism for me um, have delivered in terms of what we'd like to see. And I, and I said, um, but the question is now what type of capitalism? Um, I, I certainly am no admirer uh, of a system that basically privileges um, the rise in stock market prices as the mark of success, okay, uh, and, and, and financial markets. Um, I, I do think the kind of um, economies that we've built, where the bulk of the GDP is in financial assets, uh, where uh, people just sit in London and New York um, and basically transport money across the world into stock markets into um, bond markets, um, make huge returns and take it back. I, I don't think that is a sustainable um, model long-term. It will make a few people very rich, but I don't think it's sustainable because it continues to um, extract wealth at the expense of the vast majority of the, of the world's population. Uh, within countries, I think a system that allows, as Warren Buffett says, uh, a situation where a Warren Buffett pays a lower tax as opposed in a lower tax band than his secretary uh, is intrinsically uh, self-defeating. It, it, can, it, can, it can survive for a short while, but ultimately it cannot continue. Now, um, on the other extreme, you look at places like Norway, you look at countries where uh, you, 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 the, the tax rates are so high on the very rich and where people have voluntarily accepted that they want to uh, be, they're, they're ready to live, uh, to make a lot of money and then uh, hand it over to the state, uh, which then uses it uh, to bring up those who are less fortunate, invest in the education of society, invest in, uh, now that is more sustainable because, uh, you know, you could be rich today, you don't know where your child is going to be tomorrow. And, and what you want is a, is a system where your child does not depend on your wealth, but the society takes care of that child and your grandchild and your great grandchild. So when you think generations um, uh, going forward, you, you would see that um, countries like Norway, countries like Sweden, who think beyond um, uh, just um, cap um, income for the capitalists are more sustainable. So that, that is the model of capitalism that I think uh, would, uh, would work. And it goes back to everything I've said before. Uh, and I think it's the insight uh, that Mark Carney um, well, it's part of what I, what I gathered from his brief um, lectures, uh, 
the idea that you have to go beyond value to values. And, and that is the only way. Um, and, 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 th and therefore you have a constant improvement in capitalism. Now, if, what would it become later? What would it be called? Um, I don't know. Is it a, a humanism, humanistic capitalism? I don't know. But um, you, you, you continue to, it will be a continued progression. Um, I, I can't think of a system that, that, uh, that, that would replace it. I said, but I can actually, um, as I said, see us moving uh, towards a particular form of capitalism. And I think that would be more sustainable in the long term.